Okay, good. Good morning. Uh, well, good to see all of you again. Uh, so today we come to the final passage of our study of First and Second Samuel. Seems like it's gone pretty quick, actually. <laughs> um, so it's really been a uh, well. Or this part now is a bit of a summary and an epilogue uh, to the story of Saul and David. If we consider David's life, uh, and especially uh, the Psalms that he wrote, uh, we see his uh, deep love for God and his heart of praise. We see how uh, his life of faith uh, shined also the light of Jesus to Israel and pointed also to, to the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. So let's read the key verse. So the, they're, they're up there, right there. So the key verse is from 2 Samuel 23, uh, 3 to 4. So let's read it. Uh, the God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, when one rules over uh, people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass on the earth. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with some prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we thank you so much that you are uh, indeed uh, our, our gracious and good God who has uh, given us this chance to meet together and to uh, I pray that we would really give a heart, our whole heart and have a heart of praise to you uh, like David did and that we could learn from him in this time, O oh Lord. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, the message and may it be honoring to you and may it be, uh, Lord, uh, completely all of, our, uh, all of your truth, O oh Lord, and from your spirit. We thank you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, oh yeah, I just need to do one little thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so first, let's look at uh, verse uh, 2. Let's see, yeah, so 2 Samuel 21, uh, verse 1. So that reads, During the reign of David, uh, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. So, so part one, the Gibeonites avenged. So the Israelites, you know, they were they're God's chosen people. Uh, the, the people of the covenant and of the promise to Abraham. So here, God held them to their word. You see, back in Joshua's time, uh, the Israelites had promised to spare the Gibeonites. So when the Israelites were conquering the promised land, the Gibeonites, uh, they, they knew they were doomed to be destroyed. And so uh, what did they do? They pretended that they were from a far off country. That's documented in um, Joshua chapter 9, if you want to look it up. However, uh, uh, you know, so and therefore the Joshua and the leaders, they made an agreement. They took an oath before the Lord that they would not harm uh, these, these Gibeonites, even though they didn't know that they were Gibeonites when they, when they made that oath. And so they were stuck in the situation, uh, therefore, with the Gibeonites that they could not uh, harm them. Uh, so therefore, also, uh, King Saul, uh, he came to the, to the point where you know, he was conquering and trying to take over the land, and he was overzealous, as it says here, that he tried to also harm the Gibeonites and tried to annihilate them. So, uh, so we come to this situation. Uh, so David uh, summoned the Gibeonites, and they said in verse 5, they answered the king, As for the man who, dest who destroyed us and plotted against us, so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So this, uh, David permitted the, that uh, seven sons, so perhaps seven representing completeness, uh, he allowed them to be killed. Although Mephibosheth, uh, you know, as we know about him from earlier, he was spared. And that also may be why 
uh, David uh, took him into the palace. Um, as this event is not necessarily in chronological order, by the way. Uh, so, you know, we may wonder, you know, is this really fair? Uh, I mean, it could have it could have been that these sons perhaps had some part in in the uh, annihilation of the Gibeonites, uh, but also it could be that there that it, that it follows that there was a um, you know the curse that Saul had brought upon his family, and that it was you know continuing on to these these men as well. Well, we should consider this too and repent indeed of any generational sins. So after the the seven sons were killed. One mother uh, named Arizpah, she sorrowfully protected the bodies from birds and animals for a whole, uh, roughly six months of time. Uh, so David was also moved by this, uh, really moved by her motherly love. And he gave permission for, the, for a proper burial to be given to Saul and his uh, sons and his grandsons. So in this way, uh, David ransomed uh, the uh, broken oath of Israel. Uh, so the key point, though, of this story, you know, we may wonder why is this recorded here. Uh, I think really one of the key points of this story is that as God's people, we must hold to our word. If we take a promise, we, we shouldn't forget it or just take it lightly. I still remember when Pastor Paul's son, uh, Joe Dong, uh, he um, you know, he was attending, I think, one church in Colorado for the first time, and I, I'm not sure you know, exactly of the details of it, but he, um, he, I think he met the, uh, the pastor's wife, and she asked him, you know, are you going to come next Sunday? And he said, yes, I'll, I'll come. And then she said, you know, are you a man of your word? And so um, did he come the next Sunday? Yes, he did. <laughs> He's a man of his word, so he held to it. Um, so, so I realized uh, you know, that we need to be people of our word. You know, personally, I realize I'm a really horrible example of this. Uh, I admit that it's uh, very easy for me to break my promises and uh, get too busy with something or other. Uh, but we need to remember, you know, what we say holds weight. Because if it doesn't, um, you know, how should somebody trust us in Bible study, for instance? So uh, let's take that to heart. Um, so then the next part, though, moving on. Um, courageous men of God. So next, we'll be covering 2 Samuel 22, 15 to 22, and also uh, chapter 23, 8 to 39, just in one section, because they're, they're related. Uh, these, these accounts, these are the accounts of the valiant, uh, mighty men of King David's army. Uh, once, he, once when he was uh, likely getting older, King David had gone out to fight and had almost been killed in battle. So look at uh, chapter 21, uh, 16 to 17 there. And it says, And uh, Ishbi Benob, uh, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels and who was armed with a new sword, uh, said he would kill David. But Abishai, uh, son of Zeruiah, uh, came to David's rescue. Uh, he struck the Philistine down and killed him. Uh, then David's men swore to him. They said, uh, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle so that the lamp of Israel will not be exhausted. Or extinguished, actually. Um, so the fact that this Philistine was a descendant of Rapha means that he likely was you know, a giant like Goliath. So you know, this was a, quite a feat for one thing. And so while David was rescued by Abishai, uh, he was so valued uh, dearly by his country that they no longer wanted him to go out to battle. He was like a lamp uh, that brought a light to the nation. He was a guide uh, to them on the right path, a light guiding the way. So that lamp also symbolizes the life that we have in God that God has given us, and also the truth and the hope uh, of the, uh, that we have purely because of God. So let's pray also that our leaders would really be a light to our nation and to our church. And I thank God for many of you that indeed uh, carry that light in your hearts. Uh, so moving on then to 2 Samuel uh, 23, verse 13 
We read of an earlier uh, event uh, than this when David was very thirsty during a battle. He was at the stronghold and he was longing for water. Uh, so his three, three mighty men broke through the Philistine lines. They got the water from the well uh, and then they brought it back to David. So what did he do? Did he drink it? No, he poured it out before the Lord. These guys must have been like, whoa. <laughs> so, uh, but but he, he treated this water this way because you know it was really bought at the price of the blood of these men. So you know we know that in sacrifice, uh, the Lord said, you know, to let the let the blood flow out. It's uh, a sacrifice to the Lord. So he really offered this this water like that to the Lord God. And we could see, uh, you know, that in this way that he could set really uh, an example of an inspiration of faith to his men. Um, and, and he led by examples. And then they also followed suit. So I really thank God also for many of you who have also set an example. Uh, you know, not living selfishly, but sacrificially. Sacrificially for the kingdom of God. Indeed, God remembers you and also also the many people beyond as well in UBF and in the other churches. Uh, you know, he remembers us and I believe you know, the, that your name is written in God's book of life. So likewise, in this passage, you know, along with that, we find a listing of the various uh, mighty soldiers of David. Uh, we see there was uh, the top three the top three, uh, Joseph, uh, Basheth, Eliezer, and Shammah. And there were also others like Benaiah and Ab Abishai. They were also very well recognized. Um, and then we also have a list of over 30 chief warriors of David's army. And notably, Uriah is included in there too. So we can see how you know, David really wanted to include and honor everyone, uh, no matter the circumstances. So they're honored for their courage and their faith, uh, their valency in battle. So when we go the extra mile, indeed, it will not be forgotten. You know, even if people on earth may forget about it, the Lord will not forget. David remembered these mighty men and recorded, uh, and he also recorded that uh, uh, what they had, uh, what they had done, uh, done by them. So many of these mighty men also were those who David had shepherded uh, from the time when he was in the wil wil uh, wilderness, when he was um, you know, fleeing from Saul. Uh, remember there was a cave in Adullam uh, where there was many men that joined him. So with God's help, these men were, were made into mighty, mighty men of God. Uh, but although they did not indeed start that way, you know, when we think about the description that they had at first, a lot of these guys were just described as you know, outcasts, and poor uh, beggars. They were downtrodden people. But they could be mighty men and women of God. So let us keep also that kind of hope for other people around us too. Uh, they, let's, let's also be really prayer warriors as well. Uh, fighting not with swords and spears, uh, but with faith in our almighty God. Uh, so that's some of the things we can learn uh, from the mighty men that David honored here. So let's then move to uh, part three, where David praises the Lord. So moving to 2 Samuel chapter 22, we find one of my most favorite psalms, and I hope you find it really inspiring to read as well. It's actually Psalm 18 here. Uh, it's recorded here and was likely written at, uh, at the time of David's early victories after King Saul's death. Here David rejoices in the deliverance that he has received from God, and he praises uh, God with a heart of thankfulness. So first, let's read chapter 22, uh, three, 2 to 3. Let's read that together. It's up there. Uh, so he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge my shield, and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people, you save me. 
Thank you. David truly had a personal relationship uh, with God as his mighty protector. He experienced God's deliverance again and again. You know, there was a victory over Goliath at first, and then he went on to, to fight against the Philistines and many other, other very vast armies. And then also he was saved from the hand of Saul. You know, he, he needed a place to hide or a fortress or a refuge in various such circumstances. But in any case, he found that ultimately it was God. It was God who was his rock, his fortress, and his refuge. He could always uh, depend on the Lord. And indeed, uh, David was a man who, uh, who never lost a battle. He realized the power of God to save Although uh, we are not on the run or out fighting in hand-to-hand combat, uh, we too can depend on the Lord as our refuge in times of distress and disaster. So I know uh, from my own experience how much the devil really wants to take us down. Uh, I confess I'm weak and I fall easily. So without God as my uh, refuge and fortress, then I cannot stand Uh, and and I'm overwhelmed by sin. I can really relate to the verses that so vividly express the anguish that we face in sin. So look at chapter 22, 4 to 6, that says, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The waves of death, uh, the waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. Uh, yeah, just imagine that very vivid picture. I think this is something that we all have uh, experienced with sin. It invokes the darkness of the grave and the twisted snares of Satan. But what is the solution? David's uh, strength, uh, well, it says that uh, he, says, he says here, I called to the Lord and have been saved from all my enemies. Amen. So David's strength was that he knew who to turn to in times of distress. Although I do wish he, he knew more to turn to God in times of, of uh, peace and <laughs> comfort, of course, too. Uh, but here, he really knows to who to turn to in times of distress. So prayer, indeed, it, it can seem, when we think about prayer, it can be such a simple thing. But also how easy it is for us to miss, to miss uh, really coming to God, to try to turn, turn out our own solutions, uh, or just to simply ignore the Lord. But uh, indeed, when we come to God, everything is turned around. So David then goes on to depict one of the most powerful images of God Almighty uh, coming to our rescue. So verses uh, 11 to 14 and 17 to 18. So he mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on wings on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his canopy around him. The dark uh, rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, Bolts of lightning blazed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He reached down. He reached down and took hold of me. He drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. So we indeed serve an awesomely powerful God. Indeed, sin is not too much for him. Uh, No matter what kind of muck and mire of sin that uh, you and me may be sinking in, God's arm is reaching, reaching out for us. He uh, He pulls us and he sets us on our feet onto a solid ground on that on, our, on him who is our rock and our salvation. Amen. Psalms like these really remind us also that it, 
this isn't just about you know summarizing Bible passages. You know, it's not just about uh, you know looking holy on the outside or anything. But we really this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, we uh, we have a real situation of sin that we face day by day, um, and so um, sometimes you know it maybe it feels like we can't be emotional in the church or something. But but really, David really outpours his heart here, and we can see. Uh, where where this is very fitting. Indeed, uh, life is about, you know, life has all messy situations that we face, but God is here, and in God is very much real, and He will not let us down. Uh, so next, uh, next in verse 25, the Lord rewarded as he says in this um, David says of this the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness according to the cleanliness cleanness in his sight uh, and he also says a few other words like that too uh, so David really declares his righteousness and confidence before the Lord uh, you know this may sound a little arrogant uh, or self-righteous especially knowing that David fell uh, into adultery and murder in the case of Bathsheba and Uriah. But I believe that we also, though, uh, regardless of that, uh, and also of when he wrote this, I believe that we can really have the kind of this kind of confidence you know, before the Lord too. It's when we accept Christ's complete forgiveness of our sins by faith, and that His, and also His great grace. Then we can have the confidence that he has completely, fully washed away our sin. Uh, as David wrote also in Psalm 103, verse 12, he said, As far as the east is from the west, so far have you, uh, have, have you removed our transgressions from us. So many of us struggle to it's struggle because we make we make God's love out to be too small. His forgiveness, though, really works. So believe it and accept it. Experience the freedom. Notice also that this verse says, "My cleanness in His sight." For God sees not our sin, but Jesus' righteousness. In verses twenty-six to twenty-nine. David goes on to speak of God's faithfulness uh, to the faithful and holiness and uh, purity uh, for the blameless, but also the shrewdness that he has, uh, a shrewd, shrewd judgment to those who are, are uh, devious. He writes, All too, you save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Uh, you, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. David knew the he he knew quite well that exalting himself was not the way, uh, because uh, God uh, not the way uh, because pride is indeed uh, so common. It is almost kind of odd to to see, in fact, how David did not pursue the throne by force. You know, there were so many occasions that he could have risen up and. And uh, taking care of a rebellion, fairly, uh, you know, in a, a very uh, powerful way. But in fact, David, David knew that it was God who would raise him up, and in that way, uh, he could remain humble. So not only that, but he walked by the light of God. In fact, David, uh, David was uh, was spoken of earlier as the lamp of Israel. And this was really because God's light shined from his heart. Just consider um, how beautiful uh, the moon is at midnight. You know, think about the moon. Uh, yet that moon, you know, the moon, it doesn't have any light of its own because it reflects the light of the sun. So are we, are we also reflecting uh, God's wonderful light in this dark world? May it be. So look at then also verses uh, verses uh, thirty two to thirty four. It says, 
For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. So although Israel was a weak nation before David, God raised it to be an unstoppable force that uh, even remains to this day against all odds. God raised up David uh, for also a golden age of Israel and expanded it to its greatest extent. So what is the secret? God gives the victory. God protects and he equips. Just as it says in these verses. So far be it from, from us as Christians, you know, should, we should not be living a defeated life. For God is the one who gave victory to David and he can do the same for us too. So look at also then uh, verses 47 to 50. So that reads, The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my rock and my Savior. He is, is a God who avenges me, who puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From, violent, from a violent man, you have rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of the praises of your name. So David's heart overflowed, overflowed with praise and honest worship. He honored the Lord God for both of what he had done and for who he is. His praise uh, should be ours as well. Uh, for who of us has not experienced the, uh, uh, the, the, the grace of God and his deliverance? Even a single breath that we breathe is a gift of God, our Creator. Even when this world is done and over, we learn from the book of Revelation uh, that praise to our mighty King Jesus remains for all eternity. The songs we sing here are not just for enjoyment or are just to have a fun time. I mean, this, the songs we sing here are really our, our expression and overflow of our heart that we can pour our, out our heart um, as with songs of praise uh, because we're great, grateful to the Lord God and because of what he's done for us. So I pray that we may have that uh, you know, each and every Sunday, each and every day. May we have that in our hearts. In Luke 17, Jesus healed 10 men with leprosy, but only one leper, who was also a foreigner, Return to give thanks. Uh, that, so that got me thinking. It got me thinking, you know, also, well, even at work, I thought about all the people that have really helped me out on some of the projects lately. Uh, it's, you know, it's been, been so much. Like I see them uh, doing all that they can. Uh, and so I realized I should be thanking them more. I should be thanking them and expressing that gratitude. And then also I think, too, uh, you know, not only from a person, person perspective, but also God. What has he done for me? Wow. <laughs> um, immeasurably even more. Uh, so indeed, God deserves our praises. Uh, and he deserves you know, my praise as my Savior and my life giver. So moving on then down, uh, we, um, we see then in this, this next part that David gave some, uh, David gave his last words here. In uh, 2 Samuel 23, 1 to 7. So, first of all, in verses 1 to 2, we learn that these words, these words are not from David alone. It makes very clear uh, repeatedly in these verses uh, that it was from the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was upon him. David was just a mere shepherd boy and a human just like us, uh, but by the Spirit. He was empowered and even prophesied in these verses. Let's read verses 3 to 4 together. They're up there. On, um, so let's read it. The, the God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, 
Uh, when one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. Uh, so uh, David uh, sang a song of praises, uh, really experiencing uh, experiencing that the fear of God had given him heavenly sunshine all his lifetime. When he had the fear of God, he ruled the people with peace and love. He didn't, didn't have to rule with the king's authority or its power of intimidation. When he ruled, having the fear of God in his heart and also the Holy Spirit guiding him, he experienced that his soul was like the light of the morning at sunrise. You can see on the screen right there. And also it reminds me of also a beautiful rainbow as well. It talks about um, uh, the, uh, uh, at the, after the rain, how the sun can shine through. So, so David really uh, also had a vision that God would hold true to his everlasting covenant and bring from his line the Messiah, King Jesus. So his relationship of love with the Lord was enduring because he repented and held a right heart with God. Conversely, in verses 6 to 7, David declares, but evil men, evil men uh, are all to be cast aside like thorns, which are not to be gathered with the hand. Whoever touches thorns uses a tool of iron or the shaft of a spear. They are burned up where they lie. So without the light of Christ and the holiness of his spirit in our lives, his sanctifying power, then you know, without those, how can we expect to be with the holy and living God? If we stay in evil, the fires of hell await. But with God, we have hope to see a new day and that the light of Christ may shine in us and be uh, with us forever. Amen. So uh, the last part is an altar of sacrifice. So now we're jumping to 2 Samuel 24. We find that we find it, uh, an event that again shows how David struggled, not so much in the tough times, but more and so in the peaceful times. God has established his kingdom securely, and he had not lost to any of his enemies. Yet he had it in his heart to have a census of the fighting men um, of both Israel and Judah. So in, in uh, verse 1, it reads that God also was angry with Israel. So perhaps this was because of their support of Absalom or in some other way. And while it says that God incited David to take the census, there's also a parallel passage in second, or sorry, 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and uh, verse 1 where it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So Knowing that, uh, most likely David had it in his had an issue in his heart uh, that uh, that God allowed Satan then to come and bring that issue for, uh, forth through what had happened in these events. Uh, so we see also from the book of Job that Satan can only act within God's permission, and so uh, it seems that God allowed him to act here, and hence the difference in the uh, the descriptions. And also, by the way, feel free to go into First uh, and Second Chronicles because it really covers a lot of what we covered in First and Second Samuel. Uh, <clears throat> so certainly, also, um, uh, you know, when we think about David, I mean, David was really uh, a shining light to Israel. They, uh, Satan would really want to cause him to stumble. So in Second Samuel, in Second Samuel twenty-four, verse three, we read. Uh, but Joab replied to the king, May 
your, may your God multiply the troops a hundred times over, and may the eyes of the Lord see it, or I, sorry, our, the eyes of my Lord the King see it. But why does my Lord the King want to do such a thing? Uh, speaking of the census, so it, you know, Joab wasn't wasn't normally a man of uh, spiritual prowess, but taking a census was wrong even to him. Uh, for it says, uh, you know, we remember Jonathan's statement uh, from uh, 1 Samuel that he said, the Lord can save whether by many or by few. So we remember that it isn't by the size of an army that gives sure victory, but it's by having uh, the Lord on our side. Uh, so, but still, the, uh, the census went forward anyway. Uh, and so let's read... Let's read uh, 24, verse 10 together. It's up there. So David was conscious stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. So David's repentance set him and the nation back on track. However, the prophet Gad came to David and gave him three options. He could either have three years of famine in the land or three months of uh, enemy invasion or three days of a plague. He would have liked to have chosen none of those, I'm sure, uh, but he chose three days of a plague because he reasoned that God's mercy is great and that he'd rather you know, fall to God's hands than the hands of men. So after we have come through over a year of plague, we can relate, I believe, to the sadness and the destruction and the affliction that a, that a, a pandemic brings. And in Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 people died. Yet when the angel who was afflicting the people came to the th threshing floor of Arunah, the Jebusite, the Lord, the Lord said, Enough! Excuse me. Withdraw your hand. So then, uh, although there was still a little bit more after that, uh, so look at verse 17 then. It says, When David saw that the angel saw the angel who was striking down the people. He said, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. I, the shepherd, have done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Let your hand fall on me and my family. So David cried out to the Lord for his sheep, the people, because he loved them and did not want them to take the punishment. In response, the prophet uh, uh, Gad went to David and said he should build an altar to the Lord at Aruna's threshing floor and so avert the destruction of the plague. So David then, what did he do? At once he went and offered the full payment to Aruna for his threshing floor. So this, this man was a Jebusite actually, uh, but he went and bought that location so you can see on the map here, uh, there's the city that's quite a bit smaller than the present day, um, just on that little piece of land down there. But he, he then went up to Mount Moriah, where the threshing floor would be. And so, and so he sacrificed burnt offerings there on the altar so that the plague was stopped. And amazingly, amazingly we find in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, that this uh, not only was Aruna's uh, threshing floor, uh, this place was, was very significant because it was both the place where Abraham had offered Isaac as a sacrifice, although God had stopped it, of course. Um, and so, but then also this was therefore the, the place as well where the temple of Solomon and of uh, also King Herod was built. So it became that foundation, the rock, 
on which the, that was built. So, as uh, uh, well, and also not only that, but I also marked a Golgotha on there, which was remember Golgotha was also the place where Jesus gave His life on the cross for us. So all these places being so close remind us, you know, and, and it pays significance to uh, this as being a mark of God's, uh, yeah, mark of God's salvation for us, His people. So as this world, all uh, if this world indeed has a pandemic raging around it, let's heed David's example, also, and give not what what came freely to us, but uh, but rather give our all, and have, uh, and really have for the sake uh, sake of. And give for the sake of the salvation of the people of the world, really give our heart and our, our soul, for we are actually as living sacrifices for the Lord God. Like David, also let's restore a shepherd heart. I believe God, also in fact, I, when I think about the situation, I believe God is calling me now to really have a shepherd heart. When I hear about the pain, uh, the questions, the depression, that other people, other guys around me are facing. Uh, you know, it, we may we not be silent, may I not be silent in these times, but rather take action and give, let's give our all on the altar of sacrifice in praise to God and for salvation. So, in summary of our passage in First. First and Second Samuel, um, we we see that that we can really, uh, by the by God's light, we can be a light of hope to this world, like King David was. Let shine the light of our Lord Almighty, uh, Almighty God, in this dark world. If we do stumble, let us know that we can come honestly in repentance. But also, let's never be like Saul, who just made excuses or who also failed to keep his word. And, but most of all, let us, uh, let, you know, like David, let's consider what God has done for us in our lives and being, being grateful, you know, being grateful not only for the mighty, mighty uh, Christian warriors, uh, you know, people of sacrificial faith that are around us. Uh, thank God for, for all of you. Uh, but also, uh, let us thank God, who is our salvation, who is our rock and our refuge. Indeed, on him we can always depend, and may he be our song of praise. Amen. Let's, let's pray. <clears throat> oh, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we thank you for your great love upon us. We thank you for uh, really being with us uh, day by day and have that you have shined your light of life into, into us, oh God. Uh, Lord, we, we confess that we were in the, the, the depths of the grave. Uh, Lord, the, the coils of the grave tried to in, entwine us and, and bring us down. But Lord, you indeed are mighty. Uh, Lord, we pray, O oh God, uh, that we be grateful to you, that we would sing a song of praise to you, O oh God, that we would lift our hearts to you, and that we would be uh, people, people of courageous faith, O oh God. Help us, Lord, to be courageous, and no matter what uh, you know dangers we may face, Lord, you indeed are with us. Lord, I pray that we may go forth uh, from this place and really, really have a shepherd's heart, oh God, you know, that we would see those that need your care and your love, and that we would, you know, really be there for them, oh God, uh, because you have been there for us. You have been our rock our refuge and our salvation. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you, O God, for hearing uh, this prayer, and we give you all the glory, O Lord, in your holy name we pray. Amen.